So, um, all right. So tonight we're going to be discussing uh, kind of part two of World Mission Society Church of God. And uh, we have Kelsey Wells. And uh, a little later on, she's going to kind of give us the front end of her testimony that got cut off on the audio last week. And, um, and then Steve Matthews. And today uh, we're going to focus on tactics. Uh, what are the most helpful tactics when you're talking to members of this group? How do you share the gospel effectively? And so on this channel, we like to focus on Jesus and the gospel and kind of make a B run for those things. There's a lot of like rabbit trails uh, that you can go down rabbit holes, sorry, um, that you can go down when you talk to members of these groups. Um, and it's very easy for them to kind of just wind you up like a pretzel and get you bouncing around from topic to topic, especially if they don't like the direction that one topic's going. They'll just kind of quickly bounce off and say like, hey, well, what about this? and get you going down a whole nother thing that's kind of on a tangential issue that's not really important. And so tonight we're going to talk about what are the helpful and um, successful in a way, uh, fruitful tactics that uh, Steve and Kelsey have uh, discovered as they've been dealing with uh, people in these groups and uh, especially, you know, Kelsey being a former member um, it's going to be really crucial to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm going to turn it over uh, just briefly to, to Steve and give an overview that he tried to give last week, but the audio kind of uh, cut off. And so, Steve, give us an overview of this group and kind of what they believe and why we should, why, we, why we're talking about them. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure we'll do a little bit more when we do the uh, part that got cut off from part one. But recapping here, um, the World Mission Society Church of God is a South Korean group started in, uh, they try to say 1964, it's really 1985. We can get into that a bit. But um, it's a very aggressive group. You're going to encounter them more and more. A lot of people make the mistake think it's still about more Jehovah's Witnesses, but Newsflash, there's a lot of other groups out there. And this one, uh, I'm fearing a lot about these guys that they're going to pass Jehovah's Witnesses and get more and more millions. Right now, they're claiming 3 million. They're claiming to be in 175 countries. Um, they're very, very well trained. You know, a lot of people who've encountered Jehovah's Witnesses have, you know, had difficulty because, you know, often the cults are more trained on you know central christian doctrines than christians are too many christians are worrying about prophecy or so many uh in-house debates and theology but they don't have like the central doctrines down and these are the things that are for salvation we have to really be able to preach right so we're all called to be apologists first peter three fifteen. that's why the show is on the air uh, to give an answer to everyone and this is a new group so we got to give answers to them the difficulty is as a, gr a new group comes out you know it takes a while for the church to figure out you know responses and answers so there's not that much information out there and uh you know we've been working at it and we're coming up with more and more answers uh you know breaking new ground and uh we want to get the truth out there for people so a lot of people watching this that might have a relative in there and they might be very discouraged you know they're coming home for the holidays they don't want a christmas tree in the house or they're going to argue and you know talk about how they're part of babylon and that kind of thing but you know we want to definitely give an answer um to what's in there um you know and what and one of maybe i'll start do you want to introduce kelsey a little bit or do you want to just have me go right into it i guess it's the third episode we've uh people should have caught that in the first right <laughs> well let's so, have kelsey introduce herself so so hi uh, my name is kelsey i'm a former member of the world mission society church of god i was a member for 10 years from 2007 until the end of 2017 um, and I, you know, I attended um, two different branches of this church, the Seattle and the Portland Church. Um, and I've done everything from um, being a co-young adult group leader to being in charge of the kids class and activities um, to being in charge of the, the teenagers on um, for the, the Portland group um, and also being a unit leader in, while I was in Seattle. 
So um, I completed all the course classes in the church. Um, I was in the discipleship program when I left. And, and yeah, so um, I was very active uh, within my 10 years, um, both with the group and even when I, I used to live a little bit far away from the church. So I would do a lot of um, the church activities like preaching and recruiting in the area that I lived in by myself. Um, so, so yeah, that's a little bit about my story. All right. Um, thank you. And so let's go ahead and dive into, um, how have you found success in sharing the gospel with, uh, members of this group? And maybe before we, um, get into this, maybe just a reminder of what is the gospel according to the World Mission Society Church of God. So the gospel according to the yeah, so the gospel according to the World Mission Society Church of God is um, the new covenant Passover. Um, they say Passover is the central truth of the Bible that all 66 books of the Bible point to the Passover and that we must keep it in order to receive eternal life and Passover itself is the seal of God by which we can receive protection from the last disasters. So all the books, all the apostles, Jesus, everyone, um, their their gospel was Passover. Yep. So it's a counterfeit gospel, basically. You know, this is the thing when we deal with cults is that you have, you know, you know, Paul talks in Second Corinthians about another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus, and these guys definitely have done all three of those, like all groups. So. One of the big principles we want to use when evangelizing is, you know, understanding what they mean. You know, there's a language barrier. Um, when you say Jesus to a Mormon, you know, you're thinking he's one God out of millions of gods, if not billions. God the Father has sex with Mary of Jesus is the spirit brother Lucifer. He sweat in the garden and gets 70 for our sins. And certain sins we do, his blood can atone for our own blood must wipe that out. Um, if you say Jesus to a Jehovah's Witness, you know, he's Michael the Archangel, the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. God created Jesus and then everything else after that. And um, Jesus created that. And then, you know, he, he came here as only a man. He wasn't God. Uh, he died on a torture stake, not a cross. He was uh, resurrected as an invisible spirit creature instead of bodily, like we would say in the church. And uh, he came back already with an invisible presence in 1914. Um, you know, we go down the line with the different groups, you know, with Baha'is, he's one of nine great manifestations, you know, there's different cycles or dispensations and he got replaced, you know, now by the Bab and the Baha'u'llah, um, you know, and Baha'u'llah is basically the, uh, second coming of Christ. Well, who is Jesus to, you know, the world mission society, church of God, you know, he's Christ on Sung Hong, who is second coming Christ, who is uh, foretold in prophecy is coming to reveal the doctrines of Passover, reveal mother they believe in a mother God, uh, mother in the last days, um, you know, and then he's become the Holy Spirit. So now An Sung Hong in a modalist kind of way has changed into the Holy Spirit. And so you have kind of a transitional, you know, point of what they would see as Jesus there. So, you know, different groups have different things. So, you know, across the board, like when you say to a Jehovah's Witness, you know, um, you know, soul, well, they don't believe in an immortal soul, so they're going to redefine it. If you're going to say to a Mormon um, heaven, well, they have three of them. And, you know, the same thing with the World Messiah Church of God, all the different doctrines get redefined with their own vocabulary. So it's a question of asking people as far as getting to methodology and tactics. Like when you talk about a certain doctrine, what do you mean by that? Define your terms, explain. Don't just hear the word and automatically think, hey, they're thinking the same thing as I do or what historic Christianity believes, because they certainly don't. They've redefined every single doctrine, you know, to a whole new meaning. So the first thing is to slow them down. They want to throw a million scriptures all connected to each other with you with these pre-memorized lessons. And you want to slow them down and say, define your terms. What do you mean by that? Who is who, what, why, where, when, you know, define your terms. What do you mean? So um, I think a really important principle, and this is a big one for tonight, uh, like it is with a lot of different groups is the principle of different strokes for different folks. A friend of mine used to say that different strokes for different folks. 
And that means, you know, you're going to, different people come out for different reasons. You know, uh, a Jehovah's Witness, one Jehovah's Witness might come out over false prophecies. Another Jehovah's Witness might come out over scripture and recognizing the deity of Christ. Another Jehovah's Witness might come out on, you know, the terrible translations of the rural translation or, you know, Johannes Grieber's spiritism stuff they've covered up. Just different people come out for different reasons. The same with the World Mission Society. You know, some people you want to, you know, you want to throw it all out there and see what sticks. But, you know, you definitely want to know your Bible, share scripture. That's a, a sharp, you know, two-edged sword that'll cut and divide. You want to be able to do that, but you want to be able to bring out a lot of the other facts involved in doing this. So different strokes for different folks. You know, if you're getting discouraged and you've been talking to someone, and something's not getting through, well, you know, definitely try something else. People come for different reasons. So I think... I think a really good lead in on this conversation where traditionally you might put at the end of the show, but let's put the beginning of the show is like what resources are out there for people to learn about this group and get answers and apologetics. So of course, you know, there's a phenomenal website there and right away, Kelsey knows what it is. It's the uh, examining site. So just Google examining the WMSCOG and it's a site created by you know, ex-members that has become just the definitive work on the subject. Kelsey, do you want to expound on that? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can Google it or you can just go to examining the WMSCOG.com. Um, but yeah, so it's a site created by, uh, well, former members and non-former members as well. Just people right. who want to get out the message about who the WMS really is and what they actually believe because they are not uh, forthcoming with that information, especially to people who are being recruited. And so going to this website, you'll see things ranging from, you'll see a, a few like doctrinal things, like, uh, you know, the, the Royal Mission Society, Church of God teaches this, but when you look in the Bible, it says this. Um, it also has um, non-doctrinal items, so such as like um, tax, tax forms that the church uh, filled out to get taxes of status. It's got, um, it's got uh, translations uh, in English of some of An Sang Hong's books that are not available to the WMS COG members um, because the church, for whatever reason, does not um, provide those for sale for their, their members or even allow them to read them. So those are available. Um, missing chapters from An Sang Hong's books that, that they do sell. Uh, it's got a lot of great material and it's also got um, just general items for people who maybe their their family members or, or friends or spouses have um, suddenly joined the church and they don't know where to start. It's got, um, you know, general information about cults. It's got, you know, some of the, the common things that people should be aware of when somebody that they that are for either themselves or somebody they know that joins the church, what they what they should consider. Um, and so, yeah, it's got, it's also got a forum where people can, um, chat with others around the world who, you know, have been affected by this group. So, um, yep. so I highly recommend that this site. Great place to for, start. Yeah. This site's been around for a while and it's, it's truly a game changer. I mean, when it came out, the church freaked out that it came out and did whatever they could to try to shut it down. Um, but you know, uh, in the Bible, it says, <laughs> you know, Acts chapter five, you know, if their purpose or origin of, or if their purpose or act of activity is of human origin, it's going to fail. Right. But the examining site has continued. So, you know, um, so you can see that. Yep. And then the, it's, they it's, also it's wanted, very powerful. they also, absolutely. Yeah. You'd be, it'd be crazy to start, like re not reach out, not go to that site when you're trying to get someone out of that. Um, the other fantastic site is the encountering Ansung Hong blog spot. And you can Google that. There's a ton of biblical arguments on there. They've done a really good job on that. That's a good companion site. So examine WMSCOG and the Encountering Ansan Kong blog spot. You can Google that. Those are two great, great sites to uh, look at on this group. And and one more, uh, Great Life Studios. Um, great Life Studios. That was my next. On, <laughs> yeah, you can find them on YouTube. Um, so they've done over 100 videos um, on the, the WMSCOG and specifically like the doctrine um, of the WMSCOG, like analyzing it through the Bible. Um, so I highly recommend A lot of former that. leaders, former yeah. ex-members, yourself, myself. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah I was going oh, to say, one, like, uh, familiar um, faces. Yeah, Yeah, and so one one more, one, really one more. <laughs> I feel like a church member saying that because when we, were, when we would go <laughs> preaching, we would say one more verse. So one, one more is actually um, a podcast called Playing in Traffic. 
is created by um, you know a, a former deaconess who was part of a cult and um, and uh, her sister and they've had a couple of uh, ex WMSCOG members on too so they they go through like Steve Hassan's bite model and then also again those interviews and you can really see how uh, how much of a how much of the the bite model is in the WMSCOG so. Clay and Kelsey, and, um, Spotify. and you also, why don't you hold up the book? Now there's a great book. It's one of the few books out there, but it's a very good book that you can find on Amazon. I highly recommend this book. <laughs> if you have a loved one in this group, you know, rewind that, find it, but get on Amazon. It does a good job of answering a lot of things and giving yeah. a good critique. So yeah. highly recommend it as well. It's this book, it's, it's Our Mother Who Art Not in Heaven by J. Quentin Freiberg is very, very useful when you especially if you because again like steve mentioned people leave the wms for a variety of reasons um a lot of the people i know including myself who left we didn't leave because of necessarily anything wrong with the doctrine we left more for like because of burnout um but if, if, if you really want to understand how through the doctrine or how through the bible the wms cog doctrine is not sound this book is an extremely good resource so I've talked to people recommend. who come out over the Bible and they say, you know, that was their story. And they say, absolutely, go after them in the Bible because that's, you know, how God will, you know, reach a lot of people too. Absolutely. So, yeah, very, so it's very good. So different strokes for different folks, you know, try to get that well-orbed understanding of scripture, some of the historical mistakes we're going to get into, um, some of the changes, just like you would do with any other group and, you know, just trust the Lord on that. So one of the big principles and tactics we got to lay out at the beginning is the idea of don't let them get you off track. You know, they're going to want to get you away from the central doctrines of the Bible and they kind of try to distract you. So just like when you talk to Jehovah's Witness, he's going to say, do you hold birthday parties for your kid? Do you vote? Uh, do you take blood transfusions? You don't want to get off, you know, don't major on the minors, major on the majors. You know, you want to talk about the deity of Christ to Jehovah's Witness. You want to talk about you know, you know, salvation by grace through faith, not of works. You know, you want to really focus on the main issues, salvation, flunk line issues, right? You don't want to get distracted th that way. Well, it's the same way when talking to a gospel worker in the WMSCOG. They're going to try to lead you off the, the main path and try to get you talking about, you know, the Sabbath, or they're going to try to say, you know, well, um, you know, you keep Thanksgiving or you worship the cross or Christmas. You have a Christmas tree. Don't let them pull you off track. Any more of the Jehovah's Witness talk about voting. You know, you bring it back. You're not going to go to hell for having a Christmas tree, but, you know, who Christ is is very central. And this is the kind of stuff that we should focus on. Any uh, comments on that, Kelsey? Were you basically taught on how to, you know, tell people, hey, you worship the sun god because you keep Sunday or something like that, just the methodology from an insider's perspective? So it's actually kind of interesting because – again within the wms you'll have like long-term members and you'll have short-term members so long term um you're actually told the exact same thing that you just described and that you know when we're preaching uh when we go up to people uh nine times out of ten we're going to start talking about god the mother and we say have you ever we'll see, we say have you ever heard of god the mother testified in the bible um they you know more often than not they say no and they say oh can we show you just one verse in the bible really quick um, and then usually we start with Revelation 22, 17. And so what happens is when we show Revelation 22, 17, it says the spirit and the bride say come, and then eventually that we can, or we can come and receive the free gift of the water of life, right? So when, they, when most people, who at least people who are literate within the Bible, they see that verse, they say immediately all bride is the church. And then so you, you so we're taught longer term members, you know, like the more classes you go through you're taught keep it on subject <laughs> don't try to let the other person that you're preaching to take you off subject so it's actually pretty ironic but um but so that's are... exactly what we want to do if they're yeah. going to say that because so, they have a script and they don't want to deviate from the script it's a bunch of chain verses right well, so yes yes and no let, let me let me just let me just say this so basically the the core of their teachings and training are these uh I didn't bring them out here tonight, but they the sermon preaching books. So they have five books with like 10 lessons each. And you got to go through each book and get certified wow. in those books. There you go. Yeah. So you go through these books 
and they carefully make by repetition get it down into your head so it is a very much a script now yes they can pivot like you know, Kelsey can say I'm sure but right. they definitely want there is a definite structure and a theme designed to lead you into being a member and to challenge you on your beliefs you know what you had especially if you're a Christian yeah so yeah I mean yeah there's definitely a script that you have to follow I mean literally when you see this book I mean it literally tells you like word for word what to say I mean so there is a script but at the same time the reason why you don't want to go off of script is because like for example when somebody says oh bright is the ch bright is the church and I say okay well let's focus on this particular context right because they might try to say oh look at Ephesians or oh look at Isaiah or other places in the Bible where it says bride is the church. And then, so my, my, how I would have been, you know, being in the church, I say, okay, let's focus on this example, right? In this example, it says the spirit and the bride, they can give the water of life. As we know, water of life in the Bible represents salvation. So only who has the authority to give salvation? It's God, right? So it says here, the spirit and the bride, they are giving salvation, right? So the spirit and the bride, they're doing something only God can do. So who must they be? So you you keep them to that verse so you can explain your point. And if they don't understand your point, you I was taught, you don't move on to the next verse. You stay on that verse. And if they're really not interested in, in learning more, you close the Bible and you walk away, right? Because they always said, you're not making brothers and sisters, you're finding brothers and sisters. And so, so yes, in a sense, yes, you stay on point, but... That being said, you know, there's a lot of, like they tell all the members you need to preach, right? They teach that you need to preach in order to be the 144,000. So when people are first learning or first learning to preach um, or people are like, um, you know, maybe they're not taught that same tactic I was, they will try to go and change the subject. You know, if, if they show all four verses about God the mother, like Revelation 22, 17, 21, 9, 10, Galatians 4, 26, if they go Genesis through that whole 126, spiel, 27. Yeah, Genesis 1, Genesis 126. Yeah, yeah, so when they go through that whole spiel and you still don't believe in God the Mother, that's when they might try to change the subject and say, okay, well, what day should do you think we should go to church? And they'll try to go into, you know, Sabbath day is Saturday, not Sunday. Or um, they'll, you know, that that's what they'll, mo or, or they'll start talking about Passover. Um, you know, those are usually the, the, typical ones they go but, to. But Kelsey, I'm talking also like if a Christian is starting to make mincemeat out of them, that's when they might try to go, well, what about these other issues? Like right. Christmas, like Sometimes, if yes. the Christian just mopping the floor with them on mother, guess what they're going to do? It's like the Jehovah's Witness. They, they, they go to plan B and they say, okay, now we're going to talk about this instead. And yeah. they say, no, no, let's get you back to salvation issues. Let's get you back to the things that's going to save you. So, yeah, it's fun to sometimes have your little debates, but keep focused on salvation issues. Very, very right. important. So, yeah. So, again, you know, like just as I, I think each each side gets can get each other off track. And so and I think each side is taught, you know, stay on track. But what happens is, is when people like because the WMS COG members, they honestly believe that when they're talking to you, they're trying to save your soul. So they, you know, yeah. inside them, they're very passionate that they, you know, they want to, they want you to understand. And then you're on the other side of the spectrum. You want them to understand, right? So it's, I think it's on both sides, the passion that kind of rises up within people and wanting the other party to listen that um, they start, they start getting off track both sides. And then it's just, and what they, about this? What about that? You know? So it's really important as a Christian, you know, it's, let's understand this. Who do they think they're talking to? So when you're trying to share with them, they think that you're a member of Babylon. You're teaching right. pagan religion, Babylonian. Right. Don't underestimate that thought. So they're going to basically think that, hey, you're part of the Babylonian tradition that goes back, you know, that arose after early church. The Pope is the Antichrist, you know, the, the great whore of Babylon. The mm -hmm. Protestants are the daughters of harlots. You know, this is the legacy that, um, you know, changed the Passover in 321 and in 325 uh, abolished, uh, sorry, changed the Sabbath 321, abolished the Passover in 325. And, you know, they, that's that's what you've done. And then instead you replace church of Sunday. So you're really a sun worshiper. You're following pagan uh, concepts and everything you teach is wrong. You're, you're not believing mother. You're not believing the second coming Christ. And uh, you're stuck in this long tradition of 
cross worshiping. Your church has a cross in there because you worship the cross. Um, Jason, uh, have you worshiped a cross lately? Kelsey, have you worshiped a cross? I don't know anyone who worships the sun god, you know, um, but they will make these incredible thoughts. So in, the, in their head, they're thinking like the person they're talking to is someone who's been twisted by Babylonian teaching, who's a pagan, and that they've got this revelation now in the last right. days that they're going to open your eyes, hopefully. Right. And, and another thing, too, that I want to mention, um, you know, in, you know when, they, when they're preaching to you is one important aspect. And I, and I actually just heard this. Um, I think it was today I heard this. I was listening to the Leah Remini podcast and she had Steve Hassan on there. And he, he made a point to say, you know, have the other person the, or the, the, the cult member ask them questions and have them start to think for themselves. So yeah. in the same, you know, in the same way when, you know, if, if you're wanting to share what you believe with a WMS COG member, again, making them think, like asking them questions can also be a very powerful tool. Absolutely. And, and, to, and always be loving. Don't talk down to them. Don't mock mother God and be disrespectful you know show them the love of christ you know because you want them to have a positive experience where they're challenging you because if you're just going to be unloving and mocking and cruel and getting angry and raising your voice that's what they're going to remember they're not going to remember you know the seeds you tried to plant be christ-like in your witness of course don't get flustered and with all the barrage of verses and impatient and start yelling try to you know just pray for grace and just you know keep your comments and try to share with these people yeah, because the because again, these are like these are just these are these are most of the people in the WMS COG are, are good people. You know, they're under the influence of this organization. Yeah. And you know, they they don't realize it. And so when when people because I you know I, I I see some people they'll they'll make fun of An Sung Hong's name or you know purposely mispronounce it or like you said make fun of like Mother God like that doesn't all that does. Is just it alienates them. It turn it immediately turns it their mind them. off of whatever the you're going to say. Yeah, yeah, the and conversations. So, yeah, if you're trying to win them. You're not there just to argue. You're there to you know save their soul. And if you're just there to argue, then you might as well just call them names and not you know don't tell me you're a Christian so you dishonor the name of Christ. But if you're really trying to save their soul, then you are going to be respectful, and loving, you know that way. Um, Another thing we should mention now, they don't like that we know this stuff, but obviously Kelsey's been through this, is when they do their lessons and they teach their Bible verses, they employ a tactic called transitions. Yeah. And this is the way they love to connect verses. And you know they don't know that we know this, but guess what, we do, right? So basically they'll take two verses that are pretty much unrelated verses, they have nothing to do with each other. And they tried a way to link all these verses in these memorized 50 studies, these sermons. And they try to, you know, force sometimes and try to create this transition, join these two verses to try to lead you to the end point they do. Often in the lessons, they have to get tested and graded on these lessons after to make sure you have it down before you go to the next lesson. It has to be signed off in, in the sermon preaching book. And when you're doing that, sometimes they'll say, no, 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 you don't have that lesson down right. You don't, you're not doing the transition right. You got to work and get that transition down right. It's 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 choppy. It doesn't flow. You got to work on your transition, and that these kind of the, really. These are the signatures. There you go. Signatures and then a confirmation. Yeah, from the overseer. So that this principle is when you stop them and challenge them on a verse and say, "Hold on, those verses have nothing to do with each other." Just because one of their main tactics is they'll they'll mention a word somewhere in the Bible. And they'll jump to a, another book of the Bible where <clears throat> the same word is used, but they've got completely different meanings. One might be in a metaphorical sense, that word, and one's in a literal sense. So the, the word like, for example, Kelsey will know, the cloud, that's a common one they use. It might be literal in one verse, but it's used metaphorical in another verse. So they go, if it means this here, it means this here, boom, therefore, it doesn't mean what you think it means. And they'll try to explain it with a really faulty hermeneutic. So. The big picture here is when you hear them talking and uh, connecting verses, just in your mind, think and say, hold on a second. Is this a transition where they're trying to force two verses that are completely unrelated? Is it a bad hermeneutic? Hermeneutics is the, the art and science of biblical interpretation. Are they forcing meanings that aren't even there? You know, just think for a second and be highly aware that this is something they do. They try to weave these verses together that don't even belong together. 
Kelsey, right. anything on that? No, examples absolutely. you want to give or? Yeah, so, so uh, absolutely. I mean, sometimes the, without the transition, how like the, the two verses, it falls like, apart. <laughs> it, it doesn't even, they don't even go together. I mean, sometimes they don't even have that, like you mentioned that one word within a verse, you'll go to another verse that has that same word. Sometimes the verses don't even have that kind of connection. And the only thing connecting them is that transition. And then it just, it just falls apart after that. If you take the transition away. And so, I mean, when I was learning to preach the subjects, I mean, you had your introduction, you, your trans, you transitioned to the first verse and every single verse after that had a transition. And if you could, you, you could fail a subject without those transitions. Because when you see the sermon books, like the sermon books now, there there's like there, there's like two parts in every book. One, the first part is it just lists the verses, right? And you can't learn to preach a subject just by reading that because the transitions aren't there. And so that's why you know you have to use the second one for it to make more sense. And so that's I mean that that just shows you. Um, and, and the reason why they do that too is because I, they they show the verse in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter thirty four, verse sixteen. It says like you know it says something along the lines of you know every, not one will lack her mate right and the, and the Holy Spirit will gather them together and they say that's talking about the the scriptures that all the scriptures have mated verses and that is the Holy Spirit which they teach is An Sang Hong who will put those verses together so they say An Sang Hong he put all the sermons together he's fulfilling the prophecy but actually when you the look mated at the verses. Yeah, but when you look at the context of that that verse, I believe it's actually even it's talking about animals. Um, so, but that's that's what they that's what they use to justify it. So, so this is pretty unique with them. You don't find this in other cults, you know, this whole idea of transitions. But watched out for linked verses that do not belong together by context or meaning or words. This is this is very sloppy. Understand that they have this little technique called transitions. This, I know this show is very much about techniques and tactics. You know, you're one step ahead of them right now. If you could slow it down, look at the verses, say, hold, hold, hold on. These verses have nothing to do with each other. I think that's it's very important in interpreting the Bible properly. Well, can I give you one? Ex can I give you one example, one specific yeah. example? So when you see, uh, so there's they have a study called uh, the the Christ. On, I forgot the title. Oh my gosh! But it's about the tree of life, right? And so this subject, basically through this subject, they teach that um, Christ on Sang Hong or on Sang Hong, he is the second coming Christ because he brought us the way to eat from the tree of life, which is the Passover. And so the first verse in this in this study is Matthew chapter 13 and it's verse 10 through uh, sorry it's verse um da, 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 da. Matthew chapter 13 yeah oh no um well Kelsey's looking that up so one yeah, of the ones you often hear one of the ones you often hear is like when we try to go into the book of acts you know we'll try to say that Jesus mm -hmm. Is going to come with the clouds. You know, actually, chapter one with Jesus' resurrection, he's coming with the clouds. They'll go to the book of Jude, okay. and there's a book in Job, a verse in Job, and they'll say right there, you see, you see, here it says clouds are not like clouds in the sky. There's some they're metaphorical for people. So since it's used in this verse to describe people, that means An Sung Hong is coming back as a person, as second coming Christ, instead of actually with the clouds. So therefore. All you Christians who think he's come back in the clouds, you guys are all wrong. You guys just don't understand how the, the mated verses in the Bible works. Yeah, so... So, so this I is when they do this nonsense, equivocation. Yeah, so I found the, found the verse I was looking for. So it's Matthew chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Again, this is the first verse for the Tree of Life subject. It says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet... I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So they, they say, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus, he spoke in parables. Well, why did he speak in parables? It says, he will, uh, through parables, he will utter things hidden since creation of the world. So out of the 66 books of the Bible, which book speaks mostly about creation? It's Genesis, right? So meaning there is something in the book of Genesis that Jesus wants to reveal to us. But it says what? It's been hidden, right? What does the word hidden mean? It means in order for something to be hidden, it has to first be there. But then it was what? Taken away and then it will be brought back. 
So let's understand through the through the book of Genesis, what did Jesus want to explain that was hidden since that since the creation of the world? And then that's when you go to the verses about the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life. That these two verses, the tree of life. First of all, tree of life is that a parable? First of all, and second of all, no, the, the two verses don't go together, right? But yeah, that's it's the a transition to put them together. So that's an example of like the verse doesn't even have to have the same words in it but they that transition hooks them together they forced interpretation to fit their doctrine it's awful yeah. so moving along so um i put together this uh, pretty extensive sheet and um jason do you think we can attach uh, a pdf if you're not muted there do you think we could attach a pdf of bible verses i put together on a sheet for the uh listeners yeah i think that would be great and so uh, right. you might not be able to do it during the live stream, but just kind of check back, you know, well, I'll coordinate with Steve to get that. So what I've done is I've gone through the Bible in detail and brought out a ton of verses and attack one of their central doctrine, which is the idea of how many gods there is. Now, you're going to find this tendency in the WMSCOG where different members will actually disagree or state it differently, we'll say, on, you know, whether it's one god you know, in, in two persons or is actually two separate gods. You'll kind of actually hear both. You'll see in their books. If you go to their main countermeasures book, The Staff of Moses in chapter five, it clearly there says in the second page that um, there are two gods. But, you know, where the Mormons would say, well, we believe in three gods, one at purpose. You know, what they'll sometimes say is, well, it's one God, but it's got two aspects, a male aspect and a female aspect. But, you know, here we actually have in print, you know, where it says there are actually two gods. And this is a major contention for Christians that they believe in two separate gods, a male image and a female image that were created in. They, you know, we talked in earlier in the show that they'll go to Genesis 126 as one of their main verses. And they'll say, if you look at all things in nature, you know, everything has a father and a mother, a male and a female part. Well, the same with God created us. He said, let us, that's father, mother, create man in our image there's the male image the female image that's father god and mother god but does the bible actually teach that there's two gods so check out the document uh i spent a bunch of time going through it to put it and the interesting thing is i put it in a hierarchy where the verses i think had the most impact or at the board at the beginning of the document so a powerful verse to bring up would be like malachi 2 10 do we not all have one father and one god who created us, okay? It doesn't say two gods created us, you know, the female image and male image, it says one God created us. Now, of course, they're gonna try to do this other twisted thing about Adam and Eve and the and all this. It has nothing to do with what scripture is saying at face value. It says one God created us. We're gonna quote the verses, they have their corny excuses, but we're just gonna trust that the word of God will pierce their heart and open their eyes. Um, then in Isaiah 44, 24, uh, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who spread out the earth by myself. Good for Mormons, good for gospel workers in WMSCOG. It doesn't say, I spread out the earth with mother. There's no second deity there. It was clearly God said, I did it alone. One God, not two gods. Isaiah 45, 12. It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens, marshaled their starry host. It doesn't say two, you know, four hands. It didn't say father and mother's hands. It says, my hands have done this. I was the one in creation who did this. Um, Nehemiah 9, 6, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all the starry host, the earth and all that is on it and the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything. The multitudes of heaven worship you, not you and mother. It's basically, you see from, there's, you'll see in this study I put together, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of verses throughout all the different books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, clearly repeating and hammering the thought again and again. There's, you know, there's one God. Now they're gonna go to four verses, like Kelsey said, you know, Galatians four, two of them Revelation, uh, Genesis one twenty six mainly, and they're gonna try to say, ah, there's two gods. Well, there, it's completely blown away by dozens and dozens of verses. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, but there's but one God, the Father from whom all things come. Uh, jo uh, Job 9, 3, 
he alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Now, here's a question you could ask them. Jason, I see your mouth moving. All right, yeah, Steve, I, I, I was going to just ask the two of you, and I don't know if you're familiar at all with this name, uh, but I'm curious uh, if they would be a fan of Michael Heiser. I don't know who that is. I, I know who Michael, Michael Heiser is. I don't see why they would. I know, I know his position. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think it leads into this with his argument. It's pretty different Heiser's angle. So they would. I know what Heiser teaches exactly. Um, works for Lagos, um, but this is a a whole different angle that they're saying. So I'd say no on that one. But moving to what they do say. So like you say this for the Mormon, and it would be good with them. I would say, hey, does God know everything? And they say, yeah. Can God lie? It's a sanctified trap. Can God lie? Well, God can't lie. You know, it says in uh, Numbers 23, 19, in Titus 1, 2, God doesn't lie. God's man, he doesn't lie, right? Um, well, it says in Isaiah 44, 8, you are my witnesses. Is there any other God beside me? I don't know of any. So God is saying he doesn't know of any other gods. Now, if God knows everything, God can't lie, and he doesn't know of any other gods. And the WMSCOG says, yeah, there's two guys. we got a problem here. So, okay, the reason why I asked about Heiser, I, I know that Heiser is taking a different view, but I was actually introduced to Heiser from a Mormon apologist who, you know, leaked me to his articles to defend that basically the idea of henotheism. So henotheism yeah. is not monotheism. So monotheism, there's only one God, one and only God, right? And those verses Very that different. you just quoted... I totally believe that that's exactly what they're teaching, but um, as Heiser would point out, like it, those verses are there. He affirms that there's all these verses. There's one God, but yet he also says there are these lesser Elohim that are yeah, actually real gods that have been assigned over the other nations, um, and so. I could see groups like um, the WMS COG um, using that kind of Christian scholarship uh, to say, yeah, those verses say there's one God, but there obviously are more than one God, you know, that kind of thing. So, because uh, well, that's basically Pastor what Jason, Heiser says. Here's why it won't work because they're not henotheists, they're bitheists. And they are strongly believing in two gods. See, a Mormon might say there's one God for this world. They'd say, oh, yeah, well, in Abraham chapter one, it said, and the God said, let us be man of image. And the God said, you know, and the God, they saw it was done. So they go through all the different gods. But this is a very different group. Even though Mormons are disingenuous because they actually believe in three gods for this world. Right. They believe the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost are for this world. And they're kind of just manipulating. They're kind of doing some fast switching there. But... That's, you know, what they would they say, actually believe in one God for this world. They would so say. what they would say, henotheism, is that there's more than one God, but we right. only worship one God. So Mormons would say we worship the Father, right? Yeah, this would okay. apply with these guys. Completely okay. different frame of mind. Completely. They acknowledge, they pray to Ansang Hong and Zangil Ja as two deities. They sing their hymns to them. Uh, they absolutely call their name. So absolutely a whole different scenario uh, wouldn't fly. So, and even so, it says right here, that example I just gave, um, the, the sanctified trap, you could say, hey, well, God still doesn't know of another God, then how can we wouldn't know a mother? Now they have a cornball excuse, but if you press them hard, I think these verses hold up. Um, so, so what is the you response? Know, a, I'm just curious, have you, like what kind of response would you expect to get on? on Kelsey, give me the Adam and Eve one. Well, okay, so, so, you know, if so, that's actually kind of like a, it's kind of an interesting question to ask a WMS COG member. How many gods do you believe in? Because, like, the WMS is, I mean, they, I mean, they write it down in one of their books, um, Staff of Moses, that there's clearly two gods, right? They have a whole argument for it, but yet, like, the Staff of Moses teachings are not like um, something that everybody learns. It's mm -hmm. like once you're like, you know, get through, get to a certain point. And so, like, if you were to ask a normal WMS COG member, how many gods do you believe in? Some might say two, some might say one, because they, they use the example of, like, Adam and Eve, right? So Adam and Eve, they're two distinct people. There's Adam, there's Eve. But um, when you see Genesis chapter 5, it calls them as, as one, right? 
So they, they, well, this is what they teach. So, um, so at the same way, like there's God, the father and there's God, the mother, but they're still one together. They are one God. Um, so that's why it's a very convoluted within the church. Some, I mean, it's, it's not an easy question to like, if, if like one of the pastors were to ask me that I'd be like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to answer These that I mean, question. teachers will believe. Teachers will believe two different teachers in the same room believe different things. One will say it's really one God, yeah. two images. What, the other one will say it's two separate gods. Because what they do for a lot of the verses that, that you that you shared, uh, Steve, um, they'll say like when it's referencing one God, it's talking about one God, the Father. It's not talking about so one when it God, suits them. God, yeah, so when it yeah. suits them, they'll say it's Father and Mother God together in that verse because that's the two images of that one God. But again, it's like, you know, I think mm -hmm. sharing the clarity of scripture, you know, because they try to like the very stuff where it says, you know, um, you know, only one God made everything, you know, and God doesn't know of any other gods, you know, we just have to trust the Holy Spirit to work and to cut through because they have a nonsensical reputation of it. The scripture is really clear. Um, I said, staff of Moses chapter five, they definitely say right there, even though there are two gods, they say they are two gods. They believed in two gods. So it is there, you know, yeah, they're, no, they're polytheists. Actually, they're when, bi-theists. I was, uh, when I was listening to um, them talking about uh, the three ages, right? Um, it seemed like- We'll get they, there. <laughs> it seemed like, seemed like they really missed an opportunity when An Sang Hong died in 1985 because they divided it up into the age of the father, the age of the son, and the age of the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, where is the age of the mother? They, you know, they, they, they really separate. missed an opportunity. As soon as he died in 1985, they really could have just said, oh, well, now that's it. that explains it. This is now the age of the mother, and she's still alive, you know. Um, but where that that seems to me like a, a natural question I would ask is like, well, where is well, the age of the mother? If, they claim to believe in the Trinity, mm -hmm. but they redefine it as oneness modalism. Yeah. And they even yeah. have a book on the Trinity, but they don't even believe in the Trinity. What they call the Trinity is not even the Trinity. Yeah, it's so modalism. basically Matthew twenty eight nineteen, the baptismal formula and some of that stuff, they, they do acknowledge there's a connection between Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So in that sense, they're going to try to do the Savior in three ages based on that formula. Now, Mother is being also revealed in the last days, right, Kelsey? So it's nothing, you know, it's like each, you have to call on the name of the Savior in each age, but Mother is kind of like a, uh, being revealed in these last days by Ansan Hong. That's true. They do believe that she gets revealed in the last days, but they also believe that she's separate from the Trinity, that the Trinity is, yeah. it's God the Father playing three roles, and that's separate from Correct. God the Mother. So when it comes to like, because, yeah, because they show Matthew 28 and they say like, and Matthew 28 verse uh, 19, I believe it mentions the word ages yeah. and they really hang on the word ages. Cause oh, they 20. say, <laughs> yeah, Matthew 20 or Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, it says ages yeah. and they really hang on that because they say, you know, God's salvation worked for the last 6,000 years from the time of Adam and Eve until the last days uh, or until now, right, has been divided into three ages. There's the age of the father, age of the son, age of the Holy Spirit and the age of the father, um, you know, there's there's the name of god was jehovah right and the name age or when the age of the father changed to the age of the son the name changed from jehovah to jesus so people living in the age of the son no longer could they call upon the name jehovah to be saved they had to call him a new name at that time which was jesus and then but are we living two thousand years ago no we're living in the last days they say so the age has changed from age of the son to the age of the holy spirit right so therefore the name has also changed the name has changed from jesus to An Sang Hong. So no longer are we saved by the name Jesus or Jehovah, we're only saved by An Sang Hong. And I remember asking the church, I said, well, where does it really say this in the Bible that the, you know, 6,000 years divided into three ages? And they say it doesn't, it doesn't, but it speaks about its concept. And I was like, but no, it doesn't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. So that's, that's essentially what Savior of each age is. So I would call them bi-theistic modalists. So you got the two gods, but they also believe in the modalism. And that's why you could have like the savior in three ages. That's the modalistic aspect. But then you get the bi-theistic aspect for the second deity, which is uh, Zangyu Ja, this, this little Korean woman in her late seventies who created the whole universe that these uh, kids are praying to. It's pretty mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, we can, we, you know, that's a good one to talk about, you know, how many gods there is. Uh, another huge one is let's challenge the idea of Passover. You know, they say that Passover is necessary for salvation. It's the center of the whole Bible, the seal. And, you know, we have to be able to refute that. So they're going to try to go to a handful of verses out of context. And, you know, Passover for us as Christians, it was a memorial feast for the children of Israel to remember the great works that God did. It was never intended to be, you know, a, a rite of salvation. Uh, the same way some groups will try to elevate baptism, which is a memorial rite. You know, looking back to death, burial, resurrection of Christ in Romans 6, 3 and 4, they'll try to say, oh, well, you got to be baptized to be saved. And, you know, it was never, circumcision was never meant to be saved. It's another, you know, outward sign again, um, a ritual. That was never meant for salvation. Baptism never was. And Passover definitely never was. So they're going to look at a few verses. They try to, you know, say that when Christ last supper, uh, you know, gave, you know, the the bread and the wine, they said they, they, they sat down to keep Passover, but then to us as believers, we say he expanded that concept and he became the Passover and he's the new covenant. It's not the new covenant of Passover like they would say. And, um, you know, so one of the main verses they're going to look at is uh, John 6, 53 and 54. Kelsey, how are you going to hear that uh, out of the mouth of a, a member when they talk to you? What do you? How do? What do you mean? Well, like, no. If I'm a Christian and you're WMSUG, you're going to oh. bring John six fifty three and fifty four is one of your main proof texts to show right. the the my necessity of needing to keep the Passover. Right. So just it's it's a verse often used by Catholics mm. with the Mass as well mm. to try to show uh, the idea of uh, transubstantiation that that's one of the uh, rites of the Church and these guys do it too here. Yeah, yeah. So if I were a member of the church, I would be saying, you know, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless, right, unless you eat his flesh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise them up at the last day. So Jesus said very clearly that he said, use the word unless, right? Unless means there's no other way that if we want to receive eternal life, what must we eat and drink? We must eat his flesh and drink his blood, right? And then it says, verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Therefore, if you want to receive eternal life, what must you have? His flesh and blood. So let's understand through, then we would say like that this would be the transition. So let's understand through the Bible, when did Jesus give us his flesh and blood for us to eat and drink? Matthew because they 26. say when Jesus was crucified, his flesh and blood was taken from him. But on Passover, he gave it. Right. So this is they would say this is speaking about Passover. Passover is the only way to receive eternal life. Right. And then they would go to Matthew 26, probably. And right. uh, Luke for, 22, 22. For yeah. This but the is thing, the, the, my the thing, blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. Right. Yes. And, now, in relation to John chapter six, which we hear all the time, you know, um, I've heard from Kelsey and other people that they'll literally read the beginning of John 6, they'll stop at verse 34. They won't read verse 35, which is the all important verse. And it's a real, it really blows away their idea of mm -hmm. what they try to just say in 653 and 654. So yeah. if you're in John 6, 635, let's read 635 nice and loud because that really explains what's going on in uh, 53 and 54. And actually, one thing I want to point out, I mean, my Bible's kind of beat up, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but we have That's everything perfectly underlined and the key words highlighted. Uh, my Bible is not unique to me. I mean, this is all of us and all of us that were in the church, because when we did that, it helped us bring out key words and key points. And then whatever is not highlighted or underlined, oftentimes we didn't even refer to it. We didn't read it. So yeah. like that whole section, you guys aren't gonna be able to see it, but that whole section, 34 through 38 just you know, skip yeah so and that's the one that tells you <laughs> right that's the one that tells you how yeah. we can eat his flesh and drink his blood but they skip so that. let's read that nice and loud all right so it says, john 6 35 and jesus yeah. said to them i am the bread of life he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst Amen. Yeah. So in, in 653, 54, they say the necessity of salvation is eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Well, in 635, it tells you how to be, uh, eat his flesh and drink his blood. And how do you do that, Pastor? By coming to him. And it's not by taking some ceremony like a Passover. 
How do you keep the Passover? How do you how do you take the flesh and blood by this passage? A lot of Protestants have got tripped up become Catholic over this passage because they're skipping 35. And they're thinking you gotta, you know, do the rights of the church and all this, but they're not looking the passage. Salvation is in, in Jesus, it's upon calling in his name, it's not by the ritual of Passover. And very clearly here, you, that's how you eat of his uh, flesh and drink of his blood. It has nothing to do with keeping some ritual that from the Old Testament. Um, and one of the arguments that Kelsey and I will often use um, with members is in the book of Acts. You know, if Passover was so central to the gospel, how come we never hear the, you know, the apostles in the early church preaching Passover? What does it say? It says, if, you know, uh, in Acts 16.31, you know, with the jailer, you know, he's saying, what shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved if, if you keep the Passover. Does it say that? No. I mean, you never see them preaching the gospel of Passover anywhere in Acts, and that should be a template for us. Instead, it was like, call on the name of the Lord, trust in Messiah, look at his atoning work. There's not even a slight inference whatsoever anywhere like that if the doctrine of Passover or some concept well, of Passover. Also, you know, all the times Jesus was asked, sir, what's, what must we do to receive eternal life, right? Jesus never Correct. said keep the Passover, but the Church of God, they teach it such as, they, they say specifically, it is the central truth of the Bible. All, you know, it's the central truth of the 66 books of the Bible. But yet, Jesus never said directly, if it was, he never said directly, you must keep the Passover to to receive eternal life the apostles never said that right but the but it's a, you know it's a common cult characteristic that a lot of these cults they you know they say oh something's been abolished right and therefore their leader um has to be the one to restore it and the same with the the world mission society they say passover was abolished in 325 a.d and therefore christ or therefore on sang hong must he had to come and he had to restore it so it's 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 just another it's just another tactic. But when you see the context, it clearly Bible clearly says you know what Jesus meant by that in John six. I call it Jesus plus. So it's like a lot of the cults, they, right. they Mormons say Jesus good plus good works, or yeah. you know um, you know some of the oneness Pentecostals say uh, you know speaking in Jesus plus speaking in tongues with Sunday Venice Jesus plus keep the Sabbath or the you know International Christian Church or ICC you know, uh, or ICOC, they say, you know, it's Jesus plus baptism. It's always Jesus plus. And, you know, all the way through the testimony of the apostles in the church, which we've been doing for 2000 years, we're preaching Christ and calling it his name and, and not adding any uh, rituals to salvation. Um, another verse we, we're going to hear a lot from them. And I think it's a really powerful verse. And I love to look at this one is uh, Hebrews 928. Yeah. It seems like when you hear you know, general pastor preaching, they, they go to church on Sundays, they they sit one, you know, all the men sit on one side, all the women sit on the other side, women have to have veils on the heads, and they watch these videos of uh, Juchil Kim, the general pastor, um, speaking, and it seems that every sermon, they're using the same verses again and again and again and again, just repeating them. It's like when you're in a Christian church, you're going to hear the whole Bible, you're not just going to hear proof texting like week after week, like these guys do, they proof text the same verses. And mm -hmm. Hebrews 9.28 is one of the most popular verses. So Kelsey, how would, you, how would you, you, well, read the verse and then say how they would try to use it against us? Yeah, so, I, I, and also, you know, I, I know we brought this up last time, but the, the World Mission Society, Church of God, exclusively uses the NIV. Um, so, yeah. I mean, occasionally, yeah. Yeah, occasionally they'll reference the, you know, KJV or NLT when it, when it suits yeah. them. For a specific word found within those translations, but uh, but exclusively NIV. So it says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So as a WMS COG member, I would be explaining as, you know, it says Christ sacrificed once to take away the sins, right? So that was Jesus when he died on the cross 2000 years ago. But it says that same Jesus, it says he will appear a second time, right? But when he comes uh -huh. a second time, it says it's not to bear sin, but it's what? To bring salvation. So when Christ comes back, his plan is to bring salvation. But 2000 years ago, how did Jesus say we can receive salvation and eternal life? He said, through the Passover. Therefore, when second coming Christ comes, what must he do? He must he must bring back the Passover. 
Right. So this might sound very convincing. It's like, man, I mean, they just said it right there. So you have like two comings right. of Christ. He's coming back a second time. But so we're seeing a bunch of pr the principles here. So this show, we t talk about tactics and that's great. So, you know, sometimes they're going to create transitions of forcing versus jamming versus don't belong together to try to lead you to what they believe. Right. Then they'll ignore other verses in context, like we just saw an example in John chapter 6, where they're leaving out the key interpretive verse, the finding verse on how you, you know, accomplish this, right? And in this verse, they kind of don't read the last part of the verse that kind yeah. of explains <laughs> exactly the whole thing. So would, read, read that last part of the verse, Kelsey. Who, yeah. who is he coming to at the second time? It says, to those who are waiting for him. So here's the big dilemma. So if the, if the church was gone and Babylon was in place and everything, you know, the Passover was abolished, the Sabbath was changed, <clears throat> the whole church was gone away. We had to wait for the seals to be open and Ansahan to come as the root of David to restore everything at the end, reveal mother, reveal Passover. Was there anybody actually looking forward to his coming in 1948? No, because everything had fallen away. Everything got apostate. So there was nobody looking to his coming. Obviously, that verse has nothing to do with Ansang Hong. And further, the big mistake of all the cults is they, like Kelsey said, whether I don't care whether it's, you know, Joseph Smith having restored the true church or Ansang Hong or the Campbells in the Church of Christ or, you know, uh, Ellen G. White with Seventh-day Venice, they all repeat the same lie. Sun Myung Moon, they all repeat the same lie that, you know, the church fell away and it had to be restored by the, the, the prophet, the the new Christ at the end of the age. But in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus clearly said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're making Jesus a liar. Who are you gonna believe? Jesus or Joseph Smith? Who are you gonna believe? Jesus or Ansang Hong? When Jesus said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail, Joseph Smith said, oh yeah, there was a total apostasy, James Talmadge, a total falling away, a total apostasy. The priesthood was lost, the temples were torn down, the authorities of the priesthoods were all gone. And then Joseph Smith had to come and restore the true church because the true church had gone into apostasy. We had to have a restoration. Same thing with Ansang Hong. They, he says that, you know, all the churches are gone. <clears throat> you know, the truth, the truth of the Passover was gone. You know, mother, the traditions of Babylon had sprung up. And, but the thing is, if you look at the main verse they use for this in Hebrews 9, 28, they're trying to say that, you know, the, the people are, looking forward to his coming there was nobody looking forward to coming obviously there's nothing to do with Ansan. and jesus promised the gates of hell wouldn't prevail so the church did not have to be restored it, it didn't fall away if the church did if the gates of hell did prevail against a church that makes jesus a liar so who are you going to believe this ex seventh day adventist in korea in 1964 who came along and said the gates of hell did prevail or are you going to believe jesus who promised the gates of hell would not prevail. Jude chapter, Jude verse three, it said the faith was delivered once the saints. It doesn't say twice the saints. Um, actually in Matthew 20, 20, the one used, uh, it says, I will be with you until the end of the age. Suntalea, the, the consummation, the end of the age uh, in Greek. So there's, there's no idea of restoration of the church because you know that just undermines the promise of Jesus. We can't trust his promise. We might as well throw that in right away. Well, yeah, and that's so, definitely a common thread, um, the whole restorationist movement, uh, even mainline denominations that are accepted within, you know, just Orthodox Christianity are part of that whole thing in their origin. Um, and I have a question uh, here um, while we we're on the topic of the second coming <coughs> of Christ uh, from Hebrews 928. Um and the question is, what about Jesus' warning not to go in the desert if you hear that he is there or the inner room? His yeah. coming will be like lightning from east to the west, and everyone will know. So, um, Matthew 24. Yeah. And so yeah. what what kind of response? Because that's naturally what, where mine went, my mind went in terms of uh, a natural place to go because they're, they're pointing to... Um, Ansan Hong, you know, and his birth, the timing of his birth, the timing of his baptism, and, you know, all of that, Christ is going to come again. The scripture said that, um, and even going so far as to uh, talk about why, what separated the Jews from the Christians in the book of Acts, and why did they persecute him? Because they didn't recognize or believe that God could become a man. 
right? And yeah. and what separates us from all of the churches is because they don't believe that God has become a man, you know, in An San Hung. And so what would they say to that verse in Matthew? Well they even yeah. warn they even warn about false Christs. But they would say that An San Hung fulfilled all the prophecies to prove that he's the true Christ. He's the root of David, he's he's Cyrus, he's Melchizedek. Uh, you know, he is the fulfillment of true Christ. Okay. So, but actually I want to, I want to explain too, because the church does have a rebuttal for that verse yeah. that you mentioned, uh, Jason. Um, cause that verse is in Matthew 24 verse 26. Cause it says, so if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out or here he is in the inner rooms, not believe it. So they say this verse is, they, they say this verse isn't necessarily saying don't, believe because they say second coming christ is going to come back and it's going to come back in the flesh but this verse doesn't mean don't believe like the true christ when he appears exactly and he says he's the christ they say this means don't believe a false christ because they That's say what the i just false, said yeah so they were yeah them. but they but they say the false christ the, the i mean the true christ is not going to come from the desert and they're not going to come from the inner rooms. They say, I don't know what inner rooms refers to, but that's just how they explain it. So they say, like like you said, like you mentioned, Steve, is that, you know, we can recognize the true Christ when he comes back through the prophecies of the Bible. signs. There's a lot of signs. Yeah. Well, Fulfillment. Yeah. Signs as in, uh, if you understand that as prophecies, if you understand signs as exactly. miracles, they say that no. miracles are the signs. They're against that too. Uh, yeah. Miracles exactly. are, are exactly. a way you can recognize false Christ. We covered that in the staff of Moses. Absolutely. Yeah. So they'll say basically he fulfilled the 37 years, stuff like that. And, you know, in Revelation chapter seven, after the, the figs fell from the trees, the Jews died. That would mark the time that song is coming and all this stuff. I mean, we don't have time to get into all that. We've got to got to keep this thing moving along. So, so um, you're just a follow up question. I, how do they deal with um, On Song Han's death? Um, if he's second coming of Christ, you know, the Bible says all of these things, you know, in Revelation uh, are going to happen when Jesus comes back. Right. Um, well, they've changed. They've changed their beliefs on that. So initially, you know, he was part of a group that kind of got hijacked by Mother God and general pastors. Oh, Zong Yil John, Jushil Kim basically took the church that An Song had had. An Song Hong never claimed you know we should we could transition now from scripture twisting to a bit of their history historical revisionism so this is some major problems so as i think we i don't know if we've mentioned it before but uh you know they i'll say it really quickly so they they try to say that you know like i just mentioned that uh Unsung Hong had to fulfill the 37 years that jesus didn't get to do his work so they would say that jesus was is supposed to be a spiritual King David. David ruled for 40 years. Jesus would have to rule for 40 years. we got to kind of make this a little bit succinct because we've got a few other good points to bring up. But if we're going to go super in depth, it'll be a six hour show. So okay. basically, basically Jesus is spiritual King David. He had to fulfill a 37 year of fulfillment to complete the 40 years because Jesus died in three years. And Aung San Hong did that basically between uh, 1948. And then he, when he started his, when he got baptized, and then he died in 1985. So there's your missing 37 years. So they would try to say, well, Aung San got baptized in 48. Well, this is the part of historical revisionism. Church records show, and I think we mentioned this last week, that Aung San Hong was not baptized in 48, as far as the records are showing. He was baptized in 1954. We have records of him in South Korea, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, along with his wife, and the date that he got baptized. It was 1954. He didn't even fulfill that 37-year prophecy. But greater than that, you know, An Sung Hong's son, An Kun Sap, he has a church right now in Korea called the New Covenant Passover Church of God. And he, he's clearly said that An Sung Hong, his father, never claimed to be second coming Christ, never claimed to be God in human form. He was only Elijah who would come, you know, to do you know, in this last age. Uh, it was even on his tombstone that they had the Elijah there with the names of his children. So nothing to be, Aung San Hong would be spitting in his grave if he tried to say it. And once he died in 1985, then they reinterpreted historical revision to try to say, oh, well, now that he's dead, he can't say anything about it anymore. You know, he was Christ. He was second coming Christ. Well, they completely did do the, go into this historical revisionism and kind of make stuff up and change history like that. So, um, the whole concept, you know, the church is built on a lie. It's it's built. He was, you know, he was a 
a former St. Venice, Seventh Day Adventist. Um, you know, he never ever would have taught that he was God. It, for him, it would have been blasphemy. Um, you know, and and I think that's important in the history in the in that part. So what he had said in 1985, he didn't expect that he was going to die in 1985. He actually wrote a book, mm-hmm. um, which the church does not put out, where he said in 1988, you know. He was going to ascend with 144,000. Actually, that was well, the first chapter of the Green Book. Yeah, so it wasn't right, in the book. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, so they, so he said the the other they've taken out three chapters from this book that don't fit their modern day theology. It's pretty common among groups to do this where they edit stuff. No foot, no no instant. So they said in the in the original edition of the Green Book, in chapter one, it says in 1988, Ansan Hong was going to uh, rise <coughs> with 144,000 members of the church. And they're going to send then. Well, Anzac Hong died in 1985. He thought he was going to be around till 88 to do this ascension, and it never happened. So that's kind of, I guess, a long answer to what you asked, like about, you know, how did they fit the 1985 thing? Well, he didn't think he was going to die. He had it in print that he was going to be around 85 with the 144,000 faithful members of the church to ascend at that point, and so do you think it never that, happened. Uh, it was a false prophecy. So do you think hmm? that uh, this group? could have ended up being like the heaven's gate group like in in 88 i don't think so can i well, well i, I, I want wanna... if he was teaching that they were going to ascend all at the same time in 88 that i mean that's just kind of you know comments coming you know we all got to get on the, you know I, <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's a very similar type of scenario i mean it kind of makes you wonder they would have vented another well, reason i mean yeah yeah so I can I want to I want to speak a little bit to that because I mean even even though he died in 1985 I mean there were there were still a good amount of members that still believed that you know 1988 was going to be the last year because that's what Ansan Hong said right yeah um, so I mean there were people who who did expect to go to heaven alive in 1988 and obviously it did not turn out like you know Heaven's Gate situation or, or tragedy really um, that being said. Uh, I'm not saying specifically this church would do something like that, but I, I do feel that any high demand group, be it religious or political or anything along those lines, you know, any any group can become like that. Mm-hmm. And Extremist. So, yeah. I mean, they can they can start out normal. They can start out like, you know, just a just a, you know, just a great community of people. Uh, but they can they can turn out like that. I mean, the people who are in Heaven's Gate and you know who are in Jonestown, I mean, these were people who who previously seemingly led normal lives, right? Mm-hmm. But they got wrapped up, and when you get wrapped up, and then you become secluded, you know, and only surrounded by that kind of atmosphere, your mind. I mean, that's the thing about mind control, and that's how it's different than brainwashing. Brainwashing, you know you're being affected. Mind control, not only do you not know you're being affected, but the person who's con- mind con- you know, influencing you also most likely does not know that they're doing that as well. Mm-hmm. And so any high demand group has that potential to be like that. Um, and uh, some of them write them. Some of them write the handbook on how to really control, though they won't let you eat and sleep. But, you know, it really depends on the right, group. Right. But right. And and, and the group, some groups don't even start out like this. They they but they merge into something so controlling like that, where you know in the and they become a reprobate mind. I think like in in yeah. Romans one, it talks about being handed over a reprobate mind, and people often ask that Joseph Smith know he was deceiving people. Well, he could ask the same thing with these groups, and often they might start off, you know trying to understand the bible a certain way but i think they just turn over like romans once as to a reverent mind and god just gives them over to deception but it's so this is another thing we talk about different strokes different folks uh the idea of false prophecy now the jehovah's witnesses 1914 1915 1918 1925 41 75 they predicted the end of the world a bunch of times uh, jo- joseph smith said and by 1892, with 56 years of wrap up the scene, so he thought that Christ was coming. And the Baha'is said in 1957, misunderstandings will pass away. There'll be no more wars and one language. And Baha'i cause will be promulgated in its most glorious cause. You know, they, a lot of people have made these incredible false prophecies like this. Well, this group, you know, has done it three times: 1988, 1999, and 2012. That's and Kelsey was that. around. Yeah, but these are the big three that Those we can the talk. They, they've made, yeah. yeah. So, whereas it's been out there, and like you've been through the 2012 thing yourself, you've heard, you know, all the cover-ups and all this. So, yeah. 
I think, you know, going to examining the WMSCOG website, we'll have some documentation on this. But here's another point. If this is truly God's restored true church being led by the two gods, you know, there's no way they should get this one wrong. You know, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say they're working as God's prophet, and that angels are coming down and revealing God's truth to them. And then they set these dates, and it says reports are now heard of brothers selling their homes in the remaining months before Armageddon. I mean, if this is God's mouthpiece, the faithful wise servant, the same thing with these guys. If this is like, you know, uh, Heavenly Mother, I mean, you know, we got major problems when they make false prophecies. So some people come out of groups again over the false prophecies. And this is a good challenge to this group. Like, if you guys are really the true church, how the heck do you get that wrong on the end, you know? You know, if you're wrong on that, why aren't you wrong on Mother? Why aren't you wrong on Passover? Why aren't you wrong on your misunderstanding the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. But we got to keep it moving quick, Kelsey. Obviously, okay. we've got a few more points. But what do you just, uh, why don't you give your testimony that you were there at 2012? You saw the cover ups. You went to that class in LA and, you know, Give a give a thumbnail on that. Yeah, I mean, um, so around end of 2009, maybe it was early 2010, is when um, I had heard. I mean, they did a Bible study, and of course, this is one of those Bible studies you can't take notes on, or they don't allow yeah. you to take notes on. Um, they explained that you know 2012 was the last year, and that actually it could even come a little bit sooner, too. And so, um, and not only did they say that, because I only heard that once, right? But as it got closer to 2012, the less they talked specifically about 2012 being the last year, but the more they made us prepare as if the end of the world was happening. So, I mean, they had us going out. They they had, they had they said, we always need to have, we, we, I mean, people were going out buying army bags. You, we were stocking up a month's worth of, you know, non-perishable food, a month's worth of water. Um, we always had to make sure that we had at least one of Von Holmes' books always on us at all times. Obviously, we you're had told it was the last Passover. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, things like I mean, well, we're told it's the last Passover every single year, but that yeah, particular but year, that year, but that, that particular, yeah, that particular year. Um, oh, I'm sorry, was that 2000? No, 2012, 2011, actually, um, yeah. is is the year that they made us like lock the doors for the Passover. Which um, going back to your Heaven's Gate conversation, <laughs> a little, a little iffy. Not saying they would do that, but they actually locked the doors so that anybody coming in late could not keep the Passover. And so I, I mean, that that's the only in my entire ten years of being there. That is the only time they did that was 2011, and I'm pretty sure it had something to do with 2012. So again, they had us like physically, not only were they, they, they teach us that prophecy and that wasn't actually something they taught everybody in the church. They, that was like on a weekday when only the gospel workers were there, okay? The more so, committed members of the, the gospel members, instead of just the regular yeah, right, ranking file. Right, and so again, that's the only time I heard that. I just heard that once, but it was enough for me to hear. But again, they were making us physically prepare. And then once 2012 came and went, they never told us again that we need to have like a month's worth of food, water. We need to be prepared. You know, we need to be able to go to run to the church at, at you know, a moment's notice. If mother suddenly calls and says, head to Zion, we need to go. Father's coming. Day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like they never did that, at least from my experience, they never did that after 2012. So, um, so what happened was. I mean, you go to class. <laughs> yeah. So in 2000, uh, Jonah. I want to say, yeah, early 2013. Uh, because the examining site that we've been mentioning came out and the examining site, um, you know, had all this information that had previously only been available in Korean, but now was made available in English. And they, um, so they, so they sent a pastor, one of the prominent pastors from Korea to like LA, Chicago, New York, maybe some other places. And so I went to the seminar in LA and it was a couple of days long. And one of the subjects that they covered was about An Sang Hong in, in his book that the book that they never let us read one of the books that they never let us read that he wrote they showed us excerpts from it um, where An Sung Hong had explained 2012 was the end and they said that um, they, they were telling us that they never taught 2012 was the end um, and that uh, what what he had meant by that book was that that's the year when the New Jerusalem temple will be complete and you know, to save time on that, what that basically means is no more preaching. That the end is coming soon, no more preaching. So, but yet they said, but they didn't have a good explanation for for that. 
So they said, we'll, we'll, we'll learn in heaven what An San Hong meant by that. So they, they completely gaslit all the members. I mean, there are hundreds of us in that, in listening to that, um, just in LA and said that they never taught it. I heard it with my own ears. 2012 was the end. I was there with all the other members prepping physically for the end of the world, right? And I've talked uh, to people who've done the same thing with 1999. Yeah. And I, they and told after, me they had to go through that. Yeah, and, and after that seminar, whenever somebody would look up the church online and say, why did the church say the end of the world in 2012? I said, oh, church never taught that. But they actually did, and I had heard it. But I was so conditioned that I defended them and I mean, that's, that's part of the mind control is that, you know, you're being influenced to, to repeat what the church is saying, even though you know it's not true, but it doesn't appear as a red flag to you. You, you just, it just, you know, I don't understand now. Let me, my, let me just, you know, in heaven, I'll understand later. You suppress it, basically. Suppress you learn, it, you'll yeah. understand it later. So, so we see a pattern here. So they've, they've twisted doctrine, just like other groups did. They try to say that Jesus was lying in Matthew, well, they don't say this, but Matthew 16, 18, with the gates of hell prevailing, that's another massive problem. Um, they've changed the books. They've taken things out of the books. Chapters are inconvenient, like the three chapters removed from the green book. Again, documentation, the examining sites right there. Um, you know, they've rewritten the history of who An Sang Hong said he was, uh, you know, that in 1988 he'd be ascending. That's all been changed. Um, Kelsey, how about some changes in doctrine? What are your favorite changes in doctrine over the years? You know, if, if this is God's revealed truth, you know, nothing should ever change. Just to be the pure, undistilled truth. Uh, well, I made a list. Uh, one of the ones that, you know, <laughs> just automatically pops up into my head. And it's, and it's funny because some of the change in doctrine, they didn't actually have to do it, but they still did it. And then they gaslit members. So one of which is um, they have a subject called About Melchizedek. And it's this, this, this subject where they say, you know, um, there was a physical Melchizedek in the Old Testament and he blessed with bread and wine. Therefore, you know, there's a, also a spiritual Melchizedek, Passover which was connection. Jesus, <laughs> who, you know, blessed people 2,000 years ago with bread and wine. But what happened? Passover was abolished. So Christ must come a second time as the spiritual Melchizedek and bless us with the Passover. But yet they, they say there's some characteristics. By, besides Passover, there's some characteristics by which we can recognize second coming Christ when he comes as Melchizedek. And one of the verses that they quote is in Hebrews, I believe it's Hebrews chapter um, seven. It says, um, Hebrews chapter seven, verse one, it says, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of, then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So they say this is speaking about the spiritual Melchizedek, right? So the spiritual Melchizedek, one of the characteristics is that he must be without father or mother. But as you, they, they say that it's not like physically without father and mother because everybody is born with the father and mother, but it means spiritually. And spiritually, to be without father and mother means to, um, to, have, um, to be born among unbelieving parents, right? So they say 2,000 years ago, Jesus didn't fulfill this because who were his parents? Mary and Joseph, and they believed in God, right? So they say that um, that's why one of the reasons why Jesus must come again as a spiritual Melchizedek to fulfill that point of the prophecy. So An Sang Hong, they teach, has to be born among unbelieving parents. And so, um, a while, so when I first joined the church around, two, again, 2007, they were teaching us that An Sang Hong's parents were Buddhists, right? And, so, and, and they, said it, they said it directly. They taught us how to preach the subject that way, that his parents were Buddhists. Um, and then a few years later, they came back saying, oh, we never taught that his parents were Buddhists. The funny thing is, is even if his parents were Buddhists, it would still, you know, fit their description of the, their, their, their study. I mean, because Buddhist people don't believe in the God of the Bible, right? That would still fit. They don't believe in God at all. But yeah. So they, they don't believe in God or a soul. Yeah. So the funny thing, problem. the funny thing is, is like whether his parents were Buddhist or not, like it, it still fit their you know their interpretation 
of you know the the study that they created right but again they started saying we never taught that and but the funny thing is is technology has caught up <laughs> with them so using the wayback machine if you look at one of their websites zionusa.org um, and you look at you know the site back in 2008 it very clearly says that they taught his parents were buddhists they said at that time in korea most of korea was buddhist so the odds of his parents being buddhist you know were very strong and so but now they say oh they just say oh his parents weren't buddha they just say oh his parents were unbelievers that's all they say the wayback machine is like an archive that you can look at websites that have been changed or taken down and it takes yeah. a snapshot like a time capsule you can go back and look at it so the evidence still lives on the web on, yeah. online so so that's i mean i would again you know it's not just a matter it, it's not just a matter of saying oh we made a mistake or we're wrong it's that they can never be wrong and then when they are proven wrong they gaslight the members and say oh we never taught this or they put the blame on well, for a while they were pl pl placing the blame on somebody named ron he was a missionary in the church he did an interview with steve hassan a couple years ago or 10 years ago um they yeah. said oh missionary ron he taught that you know and obviously now he's on the side of, they say oh he's on the side of satan right so they put a lot of blame on him for a lot of the the changes in the doctrine but um for, again from what it's I deliberate think. deception i some people say you know it's like some people say they're doing deliberate deception like they they make all these false prophecies it doesn't happen they change the books take chapters out of the books on purpose and then when you get like the new edition of the book you got a lot of different zions that's mm -hmm. your local churches you got to give back the old edition of the book and then you only get to keep the new one so they can get rid of hide the evidence you're not supposed to turn it in so you're not supposed to have like that addition to the book and a lot of the Zions yes, out there too. That's yeah. that's pretty shake, shady. It's not too. all Zions that do that, but it's-, it's, it's That's it's why I said some do, Zions. Yeah. yeah. So Correct, a, a bunch of them did that, yeah. yeah. So I have a question. Uh, what is the relationship between Jesus of Nazareth and, you know, 2000 years ago and on Sun Jesus, Same on Sun Same they say, person? Yes, they say on Sun Hong is the same Jesus who appeared 2000 years ago. That he came again in the flesh and he changed his name to An Sung Hong. But they say, like, they say. Korean features, of yeah, course. Yeah, so they'll say, like, An Sung Hong, he divided the Red Sea. An Sung Hong, he was crucified on the cross 2,000 years ago. They say it's the exact same person. They pray to him, they worship him, they sing mm -hmm. hymns of worship to these two Korean people. It's, it's pretty disturbing for a Christian. I mean, if you have a son or daughter in this movement, you know, it's it's tough pill to swallow, but you know, your son and daughter is literally worshiping and singing to these two Korean people. It's the ultimate idolatry of blasphemy. Okay. You know, they're just just people, okay. and and this happens in a lot of different groups. Because that, that seems like a quite a disconnect um, for them to be almost in order to emphasize that Aung San Kong is the Christ. They are discounting in a way that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies you know yes. right, right, with well, the, it's the same person though. thing right but so um I, another question like what would they do with the verses that talk about the second coming jesus coming and i'm trying to remember what mountain you know in zachariah he's going to come and descend and, and touch space and it's going to split in the river you know all that oh. um <laughs> yeah how, what how do they get from that which is clearly jerusalem to Korea. So okay, so that is it's 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 kind of a convoluted answer, but um, so first of all, uh, in relation to Zechariah, they say you know when the is, um, are you referring to Zechariah fourteen? I believe so. Yeah, Zechariah. They would say 14. Korea is the Holy Land. Well, by the way, they don't call Israel the Holy yeah. Land. They actually say in print, like they literally say in their magazines is you know this is the the chosen magazine for example they say yeah. korea is the holy land because it's the land where mother dwells and that's where the truth was uh kind of given out in the last days yeah so zechariah 14 and verse 6 uh three if i could just read it real quick mm -hmm. it says on that day there will be no light nor cold or frost uh it will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime a day known only to the lord when evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea in summer and in winter. They say this verse is speaking about salvation coming from God the Mother. 
because they say Jeru this is not talking about the physical city of Jerusalem because they say the physical city of Jerusalem is and and I don't know geography but they this is what they taught is that the physical city of Jerusalem is a desert. There's no water coming out Jerus coming out of Jerusalem to eastern or western sea which I believe are the the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. So they say this is speaking about the physical city Jerusalem but it's speaking about the heavenly Jerusalem which is God the mother that this water coming from her the living water is a water of life salvation that in the last day salvation will come from her okay. um so um so yeah so to answer in reference to that that's what that's referring to according to their teachings but one thing that I want to I want to bring up about the second coming of Christ they teach that second coming Christ is a separate appearance from when Christ will come to judge the world. So I don't know if you know that. If you guys are familiar with that. They I, teach I was wondering about that. They cuz they they're teaching he's second coming of Christ. But yeah, then they're but he still died. They're talking about the end of the world, you know, like the which we He became the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. So, yeah, so they teach So now that, he exists in this age of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, but uh, again, you know, like, cause a lot of people when they when they hear about Ansan Hong, they say like, oh, but he died, right? Because then the Bible says Christ can't die. Yeah. But um, what they say about that verse is Romans. Christ. <laughs> yeah, the verse in Romans is say, that's only yeah. speaking about first coming Christ. That after he died, he's not going to die again, but he's going to ascend to heaven. So they say that's not talking about second coming Christ. That in fact, they say second coming Christ must die. Because he can only fulfill thirty-seven years of David's throne, which Steve mentioned before, so they teach that Christ will come to bring salvation in the last days. He will die, and then he will appear at a later time to bring judgment on the world. So yeah. two different appearances in the last yeah. days. So um, let's move on to a point that um, Jason you mentioned a few minutes ago about the idea of the Savior in three ages. Now, we have a huge contradiction here. We've already, you know, described what that is to their members, where they say, you know, basically, you know, he's, he was, Je you know, Jehovah the Old Testament, basic period, and then he's Jesus, and then he's now the Holy Spirit, so you're going to call on the right name, the right Savior to get saved in that age. But what did Ansong Hong say? And, um, you know, he, one of the things we love to point out is in the Green Book, which is one of their most important books, I've got the English Korean version here as well. I've got tons of uh, different editions. In the book on page 87, this is the uh, the English copy I have. These are the words of Ansan Him himself. He says, now there are many false Christs who shall say, I am the Christ, kind of alluding to what you're saying before. As Jesus prophesied that false Christ would appear in the last days. However, salvation is found in no other name than Jesus not only at his first coming, but even in the last days. So Kelsey, why is that a massive problem for them? Because the WMS teaches differently. They say that it's only through the, only by the name An Sang Hong in the last days that we can be saved, yeah. right? But An Sang Hong himself said so. that even in the last days, we must, you know, through the name Jesus, do we receive salvation? So it's a direct contradiction with the one person they claim is God. So who's right? The person they claim is God or them? You know, if you're a WMSCOG member, I'd really question who are you going to believe? Your WMSCOG leaders or are you going to believe on Sang Hong? Yeah, and it's the same thing like I said before. It's like they, they're putting words. Now that An Sang is dead, they can say anything they want about him. They can try to say second coming Christ and he's the Holy Spirit, but he would never have taken those names himself. Him, even himself in his faith, he said that Christ was the savior back then in the future age, flatly contradicting what they've done to this to him in this movement. They've kind of totally rewritten everything. Pretty powerful argument. So, you know, so why don't we move a little bit into these, you know, because of time, we've talked a lot of the biblical and the doctrinal stuff. Let's move to some of the uh, behavior control that we you know that gets reported by ex-members or people that get to witness the stuff in the church of course everybody's experience is different um you know steve hassan uh in his book combating you know cult mind control will talk about you know the bite model which we're all pretty familiar with i think on the show and you know and this is different a systematic way that you know it's kind of a nice acronym the way to sort of you know teach people a good way to get this, you know, idea of control.
But, you know, you find all the stuff that Hassan said, you know, very clearly in this group. Um, often it's not just a question, do they check the boxes? But it's a question of the extent they check the boxes. So if, if you know, you could say it's like, well, they check the box, but they're like a two and a 10. That's one thing, but if they're checking those boxes, they're like nines and tens, we've got serious issues here. It's a question of the extent they do it. So it's it's pretty well known. Uh, you know, a lot of people will talk and there's reports made that when people come out, they'll often say they weren't happy inside the group. They tried to put on this, this face of happiness, but they were completely motivated by fear, guilt, and shame constantly. They're constantly rebuked. You know, there was a there's a writer who a sociologist who said like about the Jehovah's Witnesses that they're living on the precipice of the end of Armageddon. You know that any second now, you know, could be Armageddon, and it's very much the same thing in this group that they're always thought that Father could come at any time, and that you know we have to you know get, preach out there. But it's just like in our own lives, this fear and this being caught doing things. You know, like we I think we talked last time, like you don't want to step outside you know, design the church to make a run for the store because what if father came then? You know, it's that whole fear factor. You're always, you know, living under this con. They motivate you. The deaconesses and missionaries will take you aside and just rip into you very harshly that you're never doing enough with this fear, guilt, and shame. Um, so that that's a real way of motivating uh, that a lot of people talk about when they came out. Kelsey, have you witnessed this or experienced a lot of this in your life? Oh, this, this mental pressure, this burden, this guilt, humiliation. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like one of the things that they used to use the, uh, the example in the Bible is when Jesus, I think he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Right. They say, oh, Jesus called Matthew 16, Peter. 23. Yeah, they said or, yeah. Uh, Jesus called Peter Satan. Right. Think about if mother were to call you Satan, how would you feel? You'd be extremely offended. You might even leave. Right. But Peter, he's still stuck by Jesus. So, um, you know, in the same way, like we shouldn't be like offended when people rebuke us. And they even show, I, I don't remember what verse it is, but they show, um, I think it's Romans 12. Roman or Hebrews 12? I think Hebrews It's 12. Hebrews. That's Hebrews. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews That's 12. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, you should, you should, you know, you should be glad that you're being rebuked. Right. And it's, it sucks. I mean, it, it sucks. Some, you, some they, they're you're hardcore. Even, yeah, you're not it's even. It's not like a mainstream church. They they go at you really hard. They yeah. make you feel really small. They they tear you down. Like you're yeah. you're hurting mother, and mother had to you know walk through the snow and right. and pray to her knees were sore, and you're and you're doing all this to mother. You're hurting her heart and everything, right? Real it's quick. it's very. They make it very personal. Real quick, yeah. uh, you know, natural response that just kind of came to my mind when they're bringing up Peter and Jesus called him Satan. Peter's still stuck by Jesus. Well, what do you see happen a little bit later when Jesus is being crucified and Peter's denying him? Peter denies Jesus, even curses him, mm -hmm. and yet Jesus doesn't leave him. Right? Can you say that about this group? Oh, absolutely you know, like, not. <laughs> you know, uh, you know one not. of the one of the things that um, I, I find kind of an interesting. If you just kind of go to that scene, you know, the the, the cock crows, you know, a third time, and Peter like realizes like what Jesus said was true, and who comes out as they're leading him away, you know, Jesus. Jesus catches mm -hmm. Peter. What expression? Mm -hmm. I, I love to ask people, what expression? do you see on Jesus' face? You imagine that scene. Mm -hmm. See, because like I believe, you know, and John Corson pointed this out one time, you know, Noah found favor in the in the eyes of the Lord. Right? I said, yeah. And I, I don't think that there was a look of judgment. I, you know, Paul says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. What Peter saw was the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus on his face you know hey i know what you did and i still love you i told you you were going to do it you know i still love you i'm still praying for you and that brought like that conviction and that's something that the, the people in this group they just don't they don't experience that kind of grace that kind of love that kind of mercy like it's intense peace yeah it's conditional yeah i, I mean, mean it's conditional you know these these korean groups so we were talking in the week you know i mean you got 
four of the more prominent Korean groups out there, very controversial new religious movements, some people call them cults, would be the World Mission Society Church of God, Shincheonji, Unification Church, and JSM, <coughs> you know, the, uh, the Providence Church. <coughs> they, they all have, you know, new leaders restoring it, you know, um, a bunch of them would actually say, you know, that they are actually a second coming Christ, you know, these Korean leaders, but they, the way they push the people really hard and they demand so much. And I mean, they like a common thing is for Shinshanji, as well as the World Mission Society Church of God, <coughs> excuse me, they'll both say going on the internet is eating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. You know, now Moon, Moon, now there's like three different groups in the Moonies, but you know, they would tend to discourage it. Definitely is discouraged in JSM. <coughs> and the high degree, your high control, high demand groups, which control your time, your sleep, your association with other people, your ability to think for yourself, um, the, that whole coercion that's reported by a lot of people, former members and witnesses of this group that people experience. Um, and, and the idea like, you know, you, you not even going on the internet, not reading critical literature, not being able to think for yourself or to, you know, search for things. It's, it's very disturbing. And it's like, you know, I was hearing a, a testimony with Kelsey of, of a friend of ours who came out of Shinchanji. <coughs> he came out by listening to Kelsey's testimony why she left the WMSEOG. And that really spiked his heart because she was talking about all the control and the burden and everything that she's going through. And this guy in Shinshandri said, holy cow, wait, I'm going through that too in this other Korean group. Because that's what these groups do to people, this whole, this whole mental control, behavior, information, thought, emotional control. He was going through exactly the same thing as Kelsey and by doing that, the blinders came off and he started to look and then he's now he's a Christian and he, and he realized this stuff is just flat wrong. Yeah, and so, I've heard, uh, you know, Steve, these patterns. I've heard Steve Hassan um, talk about, I think it was actually on Scientology in the Aftermath where he was uh, talking about how he won't talk about their group. He'll actually yeah. use another group and then get them to react to the yeah. things that the other group's doing and then ask you know kind of turn it back in like as he's talking about this other group they realize oh wait 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 that's <laughs> that's what my group does wait you mean that's not okay like um i've, it, I've got a six hour class uh on udemy there's a like introduction to cults you can get for pretty cheap and he kind of gets into some of that you know methodology it's mm -hmm. pretty cool and then that's actually kind of what helped me too i mean when we're talking we're talking tactics right on you know how to witness to mm -hmm you know, um, WMSCOG members. And that's actually, a, you know, a really good tactic is to, you know, share like, okay, like not from your own cult, but from, from something else. Because for me, um, what helped me was I was watching that, the uh, Leah Remini show, um, the, the aftermath show about Scientology. And <laughs> Scientology, I mean, the doctrine of Scientology versus WMS is night and day, right? It's totally mm -hmm. different. Right. And but yet their their framework and their tactics are very, very similar. And I watched that when I was still a member of the WMS COG. Mm -hmm. And so me watching that as still a member, I was able to recognize that, oh, these these things happen in, in the WMS COG as well. To, to the point where I actually turned the show off. Like I I was watching like episode after episode and I stopped watching the show because I was like this is too close for comfort it hurts it was, well it was making me have thoughts like oh wait a minute you know I'm in a cult like I should leave like that it was giving me those kind of thoughts and so that's why I turned it off so that I wouldn't be influenced anymore and so I know I know others who you know they're trying to get their spouse out of the church so what they do is they'll show you know they'll, they'll sit down and watch a documentary about like Jonestown or something with them and say can you believe the can you believe these people did that and they're like yeah that's crazy and then um, we'll kind of be like well you know with your leader would you be willing to do anything for your leader to the point of death and that 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 really gets them thinking because most members would be willing to do i mean at me as a member i would have been willing to do anything wow. that they told me to do so well hopefully jason no one in your congregation would do that for you you know what i, I mean like that's I, the no. big difference in a, I, I, in, I don't in think a, that's a, in a healthy church you know whether it's a chuck smith or john mccarth or rick warren i don't you know that's not healthy thinking i mean the the massive difference between a regular christian church like the one you lead 
or you know these other Christian leaders, there's they don't have any of this behavior. I mean, if somebody wanted to go on an atheist website or a Muslim website and kind of learn and you know what they believe and learn the arguments, you wouldn't tell them like, oh, you're gonna die and go to hell, and you're you're gonna you know. It's like you know Christians, we are allowed to think with our mind. We're not like mind controlled like that. You know, it's definitely spiritual maturity, but at the same time, there's a you know, it's a whole different way of thinking. So, like we said earlier, different strokes for different folks, you know, it could be, you know, changes in doctrine. It could be this heavy-handed control in the group and the change of your life where you've been told to disassociate from your friends, spend less time with your family, spend seven days a week at your church building, preaching, giving 40% of your money away effectively. I mean, it just, the list is long. So people come out over the false prophecies, um, you know, scripture, there's a lot of different things to, you know, to bring you out. Um, another thing it's important is um, with a lot of these groups, uh, a lot of these Korean groups too, uh, you know, among other groups, it's okay to lie. So in Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they call it theocratic war strategy, theocratic tact, you know, page 1348, Aided Bible Understanding. Lying generally involves telling the tr- not telling the truth to someone who has the right to know it. You know, they redefine what a lie is. And then, and Shinshanji is called the wisdom of hiddenness. You know, uh, they, they have all these different excuses, you know, heavenly deception you'll hear about. Well, basically, you know, these guys are very deceptive. They'll, they'll use different, you know, front group names. They'll, they'll they come to your door as Elohim Academy. Um, you know, they, they'll pose as, you know, students on campus or in Walmart, they'll pretend to be shopping that whole kind of, you know, deep-rooted dishonesty in these groups where, you know, it's it's just, uh, you know, no lies of the truth. The fa- devil's the father of lies, Johnny 44. And these groups, you know, it's a whole different way. You know, there's no, there's God, there's no darkness in him. There's all light in First John. And, and this is the way we're supposed to, you know, be messengers for the Lord. But if you're in any group, any group who's telling you, I don't care who it is, and they're telling you, like, you know, uh, uh, JMS, you know, Providence, they'll tell you it's okay to lie again, too. Any of these groups, you know, tell you it's okay to lie, you got to start questioning, you know, what where you're at there. Um, another another big issue that's been a big problem, and Kelsey can testify, I'm sure you've witnessed this yourself, when you're out preaching, um, and a lot of people have been really bothered by this in the WSCOG, is that you're not supposed to preach to the homeless, the disabled, gays, because, you know, they're not they're not supposed to hear the gospel basically i you know i know i know the reasons why they say it but basically this is so often so opposite of christianity that's skid row in the missions you know uh trying to reach the least of these that jesus talked about you know you're not supposed to just go to the rich neighborhoods you're supposed to go to the highways and byways preaching the gospel to the lost and in this group kelsey i mean tell of your experience of you know i mean i know you can talk a lot about this but uh you know, the idea of preaching to the homeless or disabled. What have you experienced and what have you eyewitnessed in the church yourself on this? Yeah, so when it comes to, I mean, when it comes to, yeah, when it comes to these kinds of people, or even like I've seen, especially for those who have like uh, mental health issues too, like, or maybe they might be um, autistic. Um, you know, these people, they're not even given a chance to listen. If, if, if the if the church knows that they are homeless disabled homosexual like before they even start preaching to them those people aren't even given a chance to listen um because of course the wms says like they they teach that they say oh you know any if somebody is like gay they can they can get baptized they just have to renounce their lifestyle but they're not willing to do it so they say like they'll still preach to people who are gay but those people will have to give up their lifestyle in order to be baptized but the thing is if they know somebody is gay beforehand, they don't preach to them at all. They don't even give them a yeah. give them a chance, right? And so, um, so same again, same with homeless people or disabled people, right? And so, I mean, you're gonna see, right? There's, I mean, I wouldn't say there's no disabled people in the Church of God. I mean, there are people. They tend to be, you know, family members of of an active member. Exactly. But uh, but again, they don't give these people a chance. And not only do they like if if they find out after they start preaching to them that you know these people might be like homeless or gay, they don't necessarily say like okay we're not going to preach to you anymore. They don't say that to their face necessarily. What they do is that they'll they'll change their attitude and make it so the person doesn't want to come back, right? And so, or they'll they'll stop giving that person a ride, 
Um, so they do that not only with those kind of members, but even with just general members. Like if they don't, if they don't like that person, they'll tell other people not to talk to them. So when they come to the church, they're by themselves. Nobody's coming up to them. Nobody's no love bombing. Them. Nobody's <laughs> looking at them, right? No love bombing, right? So which is also you know pretty cruel in and of itself, right? To isolation and, and not only that, but like making others ignore them. Um, so that again creating an atmosphere that they don't want to come back and they'll do that with autistic people too um i've seen like a homeless guy walk into the church during dinner time asking for something to eat i saw him get walked right out as soon as he came in the door well thank you both of you um this has been a huge wealth of material most definitely we all hope that uh, those within the group as well as those who have loved ones who are within the group would come upon this material and um, that it would be helpful and uh, that it would help people to come into a relationship with uh, the true biblical Jesus and the true biblical gospel. Um, and so I just want to thank both of you again. If any of you are former members or are coming out, right, Kelsey, don't throw away your books. You know, researchers need your books. They're hard to get. A lot of people want to get out right away and just toss their books in the first week in the trash can. You know, we'll pay the postage. Let's, yeah, let's, you know, you can message, you know, Jason here and we'll make arrangements. But that's that stuff is very important for us to get the information out there that we we do keep the get the books so we can, uh, you know, do the first primary source research on it.